Hi guys, this is Josh Brown. Uh, welcome to Live from the Compound. I am here with Rob Arnott, who is the founding chairman of Research Affiliates. Rob, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, we're going to get into a slide deck that Rob has put together that explains what's happening right now in the economy, in markets, uh, and I think you're going to love what we have. So just stick around. So you have a new presentation called Recent Market Tumult and the Death of Value Investing. And uh, so, some of these slides, I, I just I, I couldn't wait to hear um, what you had to say on them. So we are going to post these up on the YouTube channel as we go through them. Um, and I'll just kind of guide you through what I'm looking at. Let's talk about this monthly change in payrolls graph. This is stunning, not just for the depth that, that we're seeing in the monthly change in payroll, but how quickly. This 700,000 job losses was as of, um, as of March 12th. Those last two weekly unemployment claims were after March 12th. So take a look at this chart. The, the monthly um, drop in payroll was almost without precedent. You had a, a handful of months during the financial crisis. You had one month that was a big outlier, uh, almost 2 million job losses, the month that World War II ended and the US government laid off 2 million defense-related workers. Now, take a look at the scale on the chart on the left. It goes to minus 2 million. Yep. The next monthly change in payroll is going to be minus the 10 million that we've already seen in the, those two weekly claims, uh, plus two additional weeks. So you're gonna be looking at a minus 15 or minus 20 million on a chart that currently has a scale that goes to minus 2 million. So imagine a spike that goes down five to 10 times as large as the entire scale on the left of that chart. So this is gonna look like a typo when, when that next uh, data point hits. Okay, so we're looking at the unemployment rate overall. 700,000 new, new uh, unemployed led to the spike you see on the far right. And the severity of that spike on a one-month basis is almost without precedent on a graph that goes all, all the way back to uh, uh, just after World War II. It's a big step up in a single month. Now imagine the next monthly addition to that, which will take it to somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 13 to 17% in a single month. This line will go blow through the top of the chart, several percentage points above the top of the chart in a single month. What we're seeing is from the labor force side and from the economic side, utterly without precedent, which is an interesting contrast to the next three slides. Okay, so we're talking about year-to-date total returns for the S&P 500, and you've pegged this, I guess, as of the first week of April, minus 19.6% so far 2020. And of course, that's a moving target, but um, it's pretty extreme for, a, for the beginning of any year. Um, why, don't, why don't you tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here? So what we're looking at here that I think is interesting. The, the previous three charts were or soon will be utterly without precedent beyond anything that could ever have been imagined before COVID strike, struck. Uh, and yet what we see on the market is a really nasty sell-off without precedent in terms of how fast it happened from an all-time high, but not without precedent in terms of the volatility, not without precedent in terms of the magnitude of the decline. Um, this is a nasty market shock, which is not remotely as extreme as what we saw in the labor charts. So my interpretation of this is the market is basically saying this too shall pass and we'll be back to a new normal that is not radically different from the old normal. The market may very well be right, or it might not. So my cautionary note here is this market reaction is consonant with the crisis passing quickly enough that the economy still has businesses to restart. The risk is 
What if it's a much more grinding long-term process? What if enough of the economy is shut down that switching it back on is not flicking a light switch? So that's my big worry. Putting aside the Fortune 500, there are 30 million small businesses. And I feel like with every month that we may remain in shutdown, it's less likely that all 30 million of them will make it to the other side. Yeah. In an average year, two or three million of the 30 million go bust. So that's losing... Uh, losing three million a year's worth would be unsurprising. Losing 10 million would be daunting. And also no new businesses starting. And with the magnitude of the stimulus, uh, will there be money left to continue the entrepreneurial innovation engine that's been the hallmark of our country? I guess I would describe myself as cautiously pessimistic. I think there's a a chance that new cases and new deaths could crest in a week or two. Um, And the worst of the crisis be over in eight weeks. And then there's still gonna be lots of businesses that still have the resources to restart. Um, Do you wanna wanna get into this uh, 30 year treasury index? So year to date total returns for the Ryan 30 year treasury index. The gray lines on these charts, are the last 50 years of individual year uh, uh, daily price charts. So right. that big bundle of gray shows 50 different years of history. And over the last 50 years, what do we see? Nothing like this on the bond side. Uh, and yet the magnitude of the run-up itself is only, only modestly without precedent. In other words, We've seen moves nearly this big, just not that jarring in terms of the day-to-day volatility. And the one market that really does show uh, uh, something truly without precedent is the oil graph, which is the next graph. Yeah, so this is returns for the Bloomberg WTI crude oil index. This is on. This is truly unprecedented. Falling by two thirds year to date with the lion's share of that drop in four weeks. Now, this is a combination of COVID plus uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia going to war with one another over um, who controls uh, market share in the oil industry. But what this misses, which is uh, even more interesting, is what happens to things that are uh, uh, the less high quality oil uh, sources or the... uh, Uh, hubs or junctions that uh, oil is delivered that are too congested with oversupply. Um, Wyoming crude, which is used for asphalt, it's not very high quality, uh, has a price that uh, uh, briefly last week went negative. The sellers had to pay people to take it off their hands because they had too much coming down the pipeline and had to clear Uh, space for the new supply to come through and had to pay people to take away the old oil. So for for anyone that says a commodity uh, can't can't go can't go to zero, actually it can get worse. It can get worse. What we're seeing is that uh, uh, stocks as of the end of the quarter were down 22 percent from their all time high. Uh, VIX was up 345 percent oil down 57% and the 10-year T-bond yield down 48%. The S&P reaction is the mildest of the bunch. So are you implying, without skipping ahead, are you implying that um, at some point it would make sense for stocks to catch down? Or are you saying some of these reactions in the other markets might be overreactions and they should start thinking more about the world like equity investors do or some combination in between? I think some combination of the two. Basically, um, I wouldn't want to forecast direction for any of these because, um, uh, as I said, there's two broad scenarios and lots of nuances within them. But the two broad scenarios are uh, by mid-year, we're more or less back to business as usual with a few million less uh, small businesses in existence. Um, a catastrophe for the owners of those small businesses, but not for the aggregate macroeconomy. Scenario two is it takes uh, 
two years to get back to normal and five years to get back to a new high for GDP. Um, those two scenarios are both well within the realm of possibility. S&P is betting on one. Uh, the others are kind of saying, we think the other could easily happen. And so when you have a take no prisoners market crash, everything crashing, um, uh, doesn't matter what it is. If it's not a treasury bond, get rid of it. Uh, in that kind of market, what you look for in the aftermath is which assets were not yet cheap, even after a crash, and which assets have astonishing cheapness after a market crash. And we're seeing lots of examples. Um, U.S. growth stocks, not remotely cheap after the crash. Okay, so this is, this is where you're, th you're thinking in terms of expected return. We have a, an expected return chart next, one that okay. decomposes our return expectations for equities. Okay. Um, this is after the crash. This is as of March 31. We have a, uh, an interactive website called um, Asset Allocation Interactive, which um, if you go to that website, we have 130 different asset classes. We estimate the forward-looking return. My team worked massive overtime over the weekend to update it. And as of Monday, we have everything updated through March 31. So as of March 31, where were we for U.S. large cap using the S&P 500 as a, as a benchmark? The yield is now 2.3%. Is that a high yield? I don't think so. It's well, high, high absolutely or high relatively, right? Isn't that the, isn't that the game? On a relative game, uh, do I think stocks are priced to beat uh, treasury bonds over the next five to 10 years? Oh my goodness, yes. Do I think they're priced to offer hefty stock market returns the likes of which people have gotten used to in the last decade? Heavens no. Historically, real growth in earnings and dividends has been about one and a quarter percent above inflation. That gets you to a three and a half percent real return over and above inflation. Inflation, our expectation over the next 10 years is 1.8. The market's expecting less than that. And uh, perhaps the market is right. But if you get that, you're looking at 5.3% return. Now, what about valuation change? So an inflation expectation of 1.8%, how long in that scenario can bond investors um, remain without drawdowns? Because the pricing that the treasury is implying or, or the inflation rate that a 10-year treasury is implying uh, right now feels significantly less than 1.8%. Do I have that wrong? That's how, how exactly you... right. The, okay. the break-even inflation rate uh, for the 10-year, uh, as of a couple of days ago, was about 1.1. Okay. Um, okay. And it, it briefly dipped to um, uh, half a percent or less. So inflation expectations are very, very low at the moment. But you've got a $2 trillion stimulus. You've got negotiations for another trillion behind that, maybe two. Uh, by the time this is all over, it wouldn't shock me if we spend $5 trillion on stimulus in, in two quarters. Um, how do we do that without creating some inflation? You're creating $5 million in new spendable money, at least hopefully spendable, because that's the whole intent of the stimulus and you have supply and goods and services uh, ramped down sharply because of the lockdown. So if you have diminished goods and services available and more money looking to buy it, then that creates inflation. So I look on this as um, uh, a pandemic creating a deflation risk and a um, uh, government reaction flipping that completely on its head and creating an inflation risk. Okay. These two green bars, the real fundamental growth and the inflation are the two biggest unknowns on okay. this chart because normally you can forecast these with some reasonable reliability, but today I would look at a, on a 10 year basis, these could each be plus or minus, uh, I don't know, one and a half, two percent. Uh, per annum for 10 years. But given that variability, they still make sense to include because of how influential they would be over what returns end up being. Right. Okay. Now, the valuation change, what is that? 
that basically says the U.S. stock market is at a Schiller P.E. ratio, price relative to 10-year smoothed earnings, of 24 times. The high was uh, 32 times uh, uh, just a couple months ago. So you've gone from 32 to 24. After the crash, it's still in the top 10% of historical experience. To get back halfway to historic norms, just halfway would be require another 20% drop. Is it in that top decile though? If we just start from 25 years ago, if we start from the age, if we start from the the, the microchip, the computer, the internet, and instantaneous worldwide communication. This is median over the last quarter century. So okay. if you mean revert towards the quarter century median, then this doesn't cost you anything and you add up the other three and you get a five and a half percent return. I'm not gonna do cartwheels over a five and a half percent return. If the earnings fall, the Schiller PE would actually uh, be even higher, but that's not in these numbers. Well, in the, o in the 07, 09, um recession, earnings actually fell uh, 90% or 100%. It was a complete wipeout um, at one point dur during that crisis. I wouldn't be shocked if if we saw a big drop, but a complete wipeout um, really only resulted in a 57% drop for the S&P. So in other words, stock prices didn't do what earnings did. Thank God. We didn't go to zero. We didn't go to zero. Um, what's, your, what's your take on that for, for this particular crisis? Could earnings go to zero um, for second and third quarter? Yeah, of course they could. Right. This is why we use a Schiller P.E. ratio, price relative to 10-year smoothed earnings, because if you look at simple P.E. ratio, the cheapest the stock market has been in the last 100 years was in March of 2009 at the bottom of the market of that uh, global financial crisis bear market. Why? Because the earnings went to near zero, and so the P.E. ratio shot up to nearly 100 times earnings. If you looked at the Schiller P.E. ratio, it was showing up as very cheap, between 12 and 13 times the normalized earnings. Now, Rob, that's that, cheap. That, o, that 09 earnings wipeout just rolled off out of the, the Schiller cape, 10-year uh, cape, okay? So just as we, just as just as we got that to roll off, we create this new massive, I, I think, massive earnings drop for, that'll that'll stick around. But that's why looking at ten years is more valuable than one year. And that also means that the twenty four Schiller PE ratio is price relative to ten years in which there was never a recession, ten years of peak earnings. If you have peaks and no troughs, that means your PE ratio, your E, is higher than it would be over a full economic cycle and therefore your PE is lower. So the 24 is actually understated relative to what it would be uh, in a cycle that included a serious recession. All of which means that US stocks aren't cheap. There's, there's another graph, the next one, that, that vividly illustrates this. So um, this, is a, this is emerging market and EFA equities, cheap right. versus the US equity market, okay. Right. So what are we looking at here? Let's take the bar that says U.S. large. It's the second from the right. That bar goes from uh, a low point, the bottom tick on the, the graph of about five, to a high point of about 44. Okay, that's the Schiller P.E. ratio, price relative to 10-year smoothed earnings. It's been as low as five times. That was at the trough in 1932. And it's been as high as 44 times. That's at the um, peak of the tech bubble. 90% of the time you were in that red range between oh, wow. okay. 12 and 20. Uh, that, ma that makes sense. That's, that's intuitive. I think when are, you at, when are you at 12, like in our lifetimes, early 80s? Um, I think you mentioned the 09. Uh, but it's, it's not often that you're... Not often. You got there in the early 80s. You got there... Um, uh, ever so briefly after the 87 crash. Uh, you got- O2? No, no, no. O2 you got down to about uh, high teens. Very interesting. Start from the highest starting point ever, pretty much. Correct. Right. So the little white circle is where we were as of March 31. That's not cheap. The little X at the top of the red box is where our model says is normal in today's economic circumstances. 
all right, I got big uncertainty on that one. Could be well above or well below that. But either way, U.S. after this crash isn't cheap. The implication of that of that X, though, where you said 24 is the current cape. The implication of that X is that we work our way down or some combination of maybe earnings work their way a little bit higher over the next couple of years and then stocks work their way lower on multiple. That's like a 20% contraction from here, though, no? Correct. Okay. Now, EFA is priced. It's based, think of it as Europe and Japan because that's 95% of EFA. Um, Europe and Japan is at a Schiller P ratio of 14 times. That's very low by its historic standards where we're still very high. That's mm-hmm. interesting. Emerging markets is very near the cheapest it's ever been, uh, 12 times. And that doesn't even get to what's going on in emerging markets value, where you're priced at about seven times. Now, when you present this to institutional investors, how many of them throw right back at you, well, there are no tech stocks in Europe, and of course, emerging markets are at a discount. Look what the high dollar costs their economies. When prices are low, you can have a a bargain, or you can have something that deserves to be cheap, or you can have a value trap that deserves to be cheaper than it is. When something is cheap, there is always a narrative out there, a predominant narrative that things are going to get worse before they get better, so best not buy this. So it makes it really hard to buy bargains. My reaction to that is to say, buying a bargain is really hard, but nibbling at it, averaging in, buying a little bit, buying a little more if it gets cheaper, is... uh, something you can do and it's the only way to assure that you have peak exposure at a turn time to buy is when the good news uh, is coming in the future and is not yet seen meaning you buy when there's peak fear can i push back a little bit on that i think you want to say i think you want to say that that's the case for let's say a country index but you definitely you definitely i don't well, i don't think you are you're not saying that for let's say an individual company or even a sector because the oil investor that's been nibbling at oil equities for the last 20 years literally has nothing to show for it but losses. So I think you're saying like for a country is not going to be as impaired as a sector and a sector won't be as impaired as a stock for decades. That's exactly right. The classic definition of value trap is something that uh, looks cheap on its way to zero. Right. That cannot happen to almost any country except if you get a total communist takeover and expropriation of all uh, financial assets in the nation. So that's what Bill Bernstein was talking about with us last week, mm-hmm. the St. Petersburg Stock Exchange closing before yeah. World War One and just <laughs> never reopening because they had yeah. a revolution. Okay, so that's And you saw risk. the same thing happen in Egypt before uh, Gamal Nasser. You had the same thing happen... Uh, to the Chinese stock market in 1949, you have this. So there are examples. Right. It happens with individual companies all the time. Correct. It happens with sectors very rarely, with countries even more rarely, and with aggregate world markets never. This market crash has taken some markets to abnormally cheap levels while not taking, well, leaving other markets pretty darn fully priced. Do you think part of the disparity there um, can be explained by the the amount of stimulus, like not even percentage wise as a, as a percentage of the economy, but just the sheer dollar value of the stimulus that the U.S. is doing or can do versus anyone else? Doesn't that explain a lot of that valuation difference at, at this present moment? I think that's exactly right. And then the question is, A, for the U.S. economy, how much good is the stimulus actually going to accomplish? Throwing money at a virus problem isn't nearly as effective as the East Asian economies, uh, including all the democracies, Singapore, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, Japan, they all have this under control. And what they did is something very simple. Um, If you're outside, you have to wear a mask. If you don't, you're going to get arrested. If you're one walking into an office tower, somebody 
military or police is there taking temperatures remotely, call you over if you've got a fever, test you. And if you test until the test result is back, you're, you're sequestered at home. If you test positive, they're going to ask who you've seen. They'll go test them. Con mandatory, uh, contact tracing. Yeah, mandatory home quarantine for anyone who has it. And within about three weeks, they knew 99% of the people in the country who had it. So that's the, pa that's the paradox, though. Like our response, in contrast to what you just described, things are totally out of, we're totally out of control. And that's why we're, we're but the reward that, that the stock market gives U.S. stocks versus Singapore, for example, or Taiwan seems to not make sense in that light. So the answer has to be the stimulus being the, the difference maker. It is a big difference maker, but I'm, I'm shifting focus from where we are now to forward looking. And on a forward looking basis, uh, I think, gosh, emerging markets are a lot of the emerging markets, you've got lousy healthcare, you've got supply chain disruptions, you've got tourism uh, uh, shut off entirely for probably the balance of the year. You've got demand for their products uh, falling off a cliff. How many of these emerging economies look at these kinds of events and say, oh no, not another crisis. This is the crisis du jour. For us, this is not a crisis du jour. This is a, a once in a lifetime extraordinary event. For emerging economies, it's just another once every few years kind of uh, uh, nasty storm. The emerging economies, I think, within two to three years will be back to new highs in GDP. I'm less confident the US will get back on track that fast. So societally, so some of these places in Asia, they could have a, a tsunami or a, ver a very bad flood season. We lost uh, over 10,000 people here in the US. They could lose that in like a, a natural disaster um, on, a, on an almost annual basis in some places. And like to your point, they're more accustomed to that sort of horrific um, occurrence than we are. And we're probably going to wind up with, I, I don't know, um, uh, 50 to 250,000 deaths. Um, which is less than a tenth of a percent of the population. And disasters in emerging economies sometimes take a percent of the entire population in one fell swoop. So right. from their perspective, this is just another nasty situation. Let's put it behind us and move on. For us, it's um, uh, now that we've let too many people spread this thing around, Let's um, shutter the economy and then hope there's enough economy to start it back up again. And let's send out checks in uh, breathtaking quantities to try and cushion the blow for uh, those whose dreams and hopes and plans have been destroyed. I don't want to second guess um, decision makers because we, we're all, we've all been dealing in new territory, unexplored territory here. But couldn't we have focused on the virus first instead of the money angle first? Uh, right. Couldn't we have said, we got to identify, we've got to isolate and wait it out and let's not shutter the economy as long as we get those who test positive out of the way. We waited right. until it's too late for that. I think we, we got to the point where before we even had the testing side figured out, we were working on stimulus. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So we're looking at value has underperformed since 2007. This is a graph of the classic Fama French value factor. What, what is it? It's you buy the 30% of the market that's cheapest on price to book value. You sell the 30% that's uh, most expensive on price to book value. And you look at the difference in return between those two portfolios. Okay. You change the portfolios once a year to make sure growth is always growth and value is always value. What you see is that for every dollar you invested in value, you wound up after 50 years with uh, five times as much wealth as the person who invested in growth. So value has worked. Only thing is you would have been 10 times as wealthy instead of five times had you just stopped using value at the end of 2007. So the takeaway here is we've had a 13 year drawdown in which value has underperformed growth by 
50%, meaning that you're half as wealthy as the growth stock investor over the last 13 years. That is horrific. That's the biggest drawdown ever. It's bigger than the tech bubble. Using several measures, um, uh, price to sales or, or uh, price to book being two prominent examples, value is the cheapest ever relative to growth, or put a different way, growth is the most expensive ever. In 2016, we published a paper, How Can Smart Beta Go Horribly Wrong? It was massively controversial, but it made a very, very simple point that I think shouldn't have been the least bit controversial. The next slide shows the performance of the value factor, the blue line, and the relative cheapness of value, the red line. The relative cheapness was at its most expensive ever back in 1977. The value portfolio was looking at the right scale, 0.3 times as expensive as growth. So think of it this way, growth was three times as expensive as value. It sounds like a big spread, it's not. The norm is five to one. At the peak of the tech bubble, it uh, got stretched all the way to nine to one ratio. Before COVID struck, we were at eight to one, very nearly as cheap as at the peak of the tech bubble. After the COVID uh, uh, crisis hit, and just devastated value stocks, which are so reliant on supply chains where, where uh, the high flyers aren't, uh, value got crushed again to valuation, relative valuation levels that are cheaper than at the peak of the tech bubble. That's incredible. One quick adjoinder to that, in the tech bubble, there were almost no earnings. There was uh, Cisco earning money, but then a hundred other companies that were barely earning anything. That's not the case now. And they still got cheaper this time, value versus growth. If you look broadly at, uh, at the growth portfolio, the whole 30% that's most expensive, what you find is that um, uh, the growth stocks are not more profitable now than they were in the peak of the tech bubble. They're a little less profitable, which is right. shocking. Um, but when I look at this chart, my takeaways are very simple. Firstly, the, the ups and downs in the blue line track almost perfectly with the ups and downs in the red line. When uh, value is underperforming, it's always because it's getting cheaper. When value's getting more richly priced, it's always in a context of value winning handily. So what about going from point D to point E? Point D was when the quant crash happened in 2007, the start sure. of this bear market for value. We've seen a 50% drawdown value has underperformed growth by 50%. It's gotten 60% cheaper. So if something has gotten 60% cheaper and in so doing has underperformed by only 50, 50, only 50%, that means that value, the value factor has actually been working. Value has been working the last 13 years. It's just gotten cheaper by a margin big enough to more than wipe out any benefit from the value effect. What it means is that the, um, the book value and the earnings and so forth of the value portfolio have been rising relative to the growth portfolio over the course of that 13 years. So the value portfolio is uh, a more profitable, more successful portfolio than 13 years ago, but it's gotten cheap by a margin that utterly wipes that out. Because of how much the growth portfolio has outpaced it. Correct. So what we see here is that value's gotten 60% cheaper. You'd think that would mean a 60% drawdown. It's a 50% drawdown. I look at this chart and I say, value isn't showing any signs of being dead. It just shows tremendous signs of being uh, an extraordinary bargain. Now, as with any extraordinary bargain, there's a narrative that says it's gonna get a whole lot worse before it gets better. Look at the supply chains. Look at how these companies are get, uh, many of these companies are not gonna come back, they're, they're dead. I think that's actually more true of um, privately owned small businesses than publicly traded stocks. I think the um, uh, federal government will move heaven and earth to make sure that out of the S&P 500, you might lose five or 10 companies. You aren't gonna lose 50. But out of, out of 20 million small businesses, five million of them gonna go? It wouldn't surprise me in the least. And that's, that's a huge tragedy. Um, by not focusing on the virus, but focusing on the money, 
uh, uh, I think we missed an opportunity uh, to actually save lives. Um, and what I mean by that is we could have saved lives by focusing on the virus earlier. We could also lose more lives in the shutdown than are lost to COVID. Suicide, depression, Suicide, alcoholism. drug abuse. Right. Um, people with heart disease, lung conditions, uh, cancer, who can't get their meds because of pharmaceutical supply chain breakdowns, because they can't find a bed in the hospital, et cetera. So if we lose 100,000 to COVID, it wouldn't shock me in the least if we lose 200,000 to other, other reasons. And that was avoidable. Well, it was. And so now we have to, we have to play the hand that, that we, we, we've been dealt since. So if we are at this extreme disparity between value performance versus growth performance. And we've been for a while and it gets more extreme and more extreme and more extreme. And your argument is that the state of the economy will be more damaging to smaller um, businesses than publicly traded. What is the catalyst that all of a sudden makes the preference of the equity market investor care about that distinction and, and start to say, you know what? I'm not, I'm not impressed with a secular 12% revenue growth story. I want this 3% revenue growth story because the dividend's higher. Uh, it's deemed as safer. Like, what is the thing that makes everyone wake up and take advantage of this value? It could be something as simple as the magnitude of the cheapness, how cheap they are relative to growth. A catalyst, by definition, is something that takes most of the marketplace by surprise. I've been bearish for a while, thinking the market was very fully priced, and often would get the question, what's the catalyst that's going to cause the market to break down? You wouldn't have guessed people eating bats. Um, exactly. But I would always say, look, whatever it is, it's going to be a surprise to most of the market. And sure yeah. enough, it was the ultimate black swan, uh, COVID. Uh, so what could cause value stocks to turn up relative to growth? Let's say, what if Facebook and Google find that advertising budgets are being slashed and that's their, that's their bread and butter, that's how they make money. So all of a sudden, Google and Facebook see earnings crash. Uh, right. Could that happen? Of course it could. Is the market expecting it? Of course not. Would that be something that would cause people to say, well, wait a minute, some of these value stocks are incredibly cheap. They've got a good yield. Maybe the yield goes away for a quarter or two. Um, uh, maybe the earnings go away for a quarter or two. But at these prices, I'm a buyer. If you solicited every investor in the country, if they want to, just put a simple form on the web and say, here is the disparity between growth and value, the most extreme it's ever been. Write in your catalyst in 50 words or less. What could possibly change this? Do you think that if enough people took that guess, one of them, one or two of them would get it right when it, when it eventually happens? Often a catalyst is identified by some people in advance. What caused the global financial crisis? Sure. Dozens of personal friends saw what was happening in real estate and so forth and were saying, this is going to end badly. Um, um, but hundreds of people I knew didn't see that. I was kind of in the middle. I was acknowledging that, yeah, that could be a catalyst, but I was, certainly wasn't expecting a global financial crisis. I was just expecting a recession in a bear market. So I think that'd be a fun exercise. You're in a better place to do that than me. Maybe I'll do it. So um, people that want to follow your, people that want to follow your stuff on a regular basis and get, get um, emails from, from research affiliates and get research from you guys, we will post a link. Where, where do you gen generally tell people to go? There's at RA Insights, RA for okay. Research Affiliates. Okay. Um, there's researchaffiliates.com. Okay. And two of our most popular uh, websites are Asset Allocation Interactive and Smart Beta Interactive. Okay, we're gonna link to those. Okay. Um, listen, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, let us, guys, let us know what you think by all means. Uh, chime in on these topics. Rob had a lot of interesting things to say about um, employment, the potential for recession, the condition of small businesses in the country.
value of U.S. stocks versus international. So much stuff here. We love your, your feedback, so let us know. Go ahead and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Leave us a like. We appreciate those. And uh, thanks to Rob Arnott. We really appreciate you coming on, Rob. Thank you.